Hi again. This is the fifth of our eight lessons in the series on physical and chemical change. In this lesson, we will focus on the effects heating has on different substances. Can you imagine life without metals? Think about it as you ride to school on the bus. Your seat has a metal frame to make your ride comfortable. The body of the bus is made mostly from painted metal. The greasy engine is fashioned out of many different shaped parts, almost all made from metal. None of the many electric circuits in the bus would work without an especially useful metal, copper. The headlights, the brake lights, the flashing indicators and the lights inside the bus are all in electric circuits made mainly out of copper. There are few other substances that are as useful to us as metals. But people haven't always used metals so extensively because only very few metals are found in the Earth's crust as pure elements. Most metals have to be extracted from compounds in which there are atoms of the metal element. Copper is one of the metals that is found in the Earth's crust in a variety of different minerals. The copper in minerals doesn't look like copper and it has none of the useful properties of copper. Copper atoms must be extracted from or taken out of these minerals. Extracting copper atoms from minerals involves changing the minerals and it is these changes that we will find out more about during this lesson. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the effect of heating malachite and copper in open systems, explain the meaning of decomposition and synthesis, and use the law of constant composition. The process of changing copper minerals into copper was discovered about 6,000 years ago in the Middle East. People must have discovered how to make the change happen accidentally. Imagine brightly colored rocks like malachite and azurite finding their way into a cooking fire. In the heat of the fire, carbon from burnt wood reacted with these minerals. Imagine someone finding small pellets or beads of copper in the ash when the fire died down. People must have soon discovered that these reddish brown pellets had amazing properties. Beating these pellets with a stone easily changed their shape. People could flatten them, bend them into whatever shape they wished and the copper didn't shatter. The new material, copper, must have seemed quite magical because it had properties quite unlike any other available material. Later, people extracted copper from its minerals deliberately. Archaeologists have found the remains of very old settlements in many places in South Africa where copper was extracted. Near Palabora, archaeologists have found a five meter long tunnel ending in a gallery that shows that people mined copper minerals about 1,200 years ago in that area. People living in these old settlements heated copper minerals in ovens made from clay called furnaces, similar to this one. Let's find out what happens to copper mineral, say malachite, inside a furnace. We won't use a furnace, of course. Rather, we will investigate malachite in much the same way as a French chemist, Joseph Louis Proust, did in about 1799, heating it in a flame. Hi there, everyone. I'm going to heat some malachite in an open test tube. Watch what happens. It isn't melting, but its color is changing. It's going black. Is this black solid a new substance? Proust must have asked the same question when he heated his malachite samples. Sometimes it's impossible to tell what happens during heating. That's why Proust made measurements of the green malachite before heating and the black powder that was left over after heating. He may have got some data like this. Let's have a closer look at it. This shows that heating a sample of 10 grams of the green powder results in producing 6 grams of the black powder. So when you heat malachite, mass is lost. Let's go back to Diasha to find out why. Thanks, John. Well, Proust heated many different samples to make sure of this discovery, but he always found that the malachite lost mass when he heated it. Look, 19 grams is less than 30 grams. Heating 100 grams of green powder forms 64 grams of black powder. This means that the black solid is a new substance. 
New substances form during chemical changes, so heating malachite causes it to change chemically. Since malachite loses a lot of its mass during the heating, it breaks down to form a simpler substance. This breaking down of simpler substances is called decomposition. So we say that malachite decomposes when heated. Prost knew that malachite is copper carbonate and that heating it changes it into copper oxide and a gas, carbon dioxide. The word equation that describes the decomposition of copper carbonate on heating is copper carbonate, brackets S, green, becomes copper oxide, brackets S, black, plus carbon dioxide, brackets G. The gas, of course, escapes from the open test tube. We call an experimental setup from which matter can escape an open system. That explains why malachite loses mass on heating. But Proust noticed other things too from the careful measurements he made. Do you also notice that the bigger the mass of malachite, the bigger the mass of copper oxide that forms? When Proust divided the mass of copper oxide formed by the given mass of copper carbonate, he found that for each sample this mass ratio had the same value, 0 0,64. This was a great surprise to Proust. As a matter of fact, he was so fascinated by this that he repeated the experiments with an artificial carbonate of copper that he manufactured in his lab. But the results remained the same. He concluded that the proportion of copper oxide to copper carbonate is always the same whether the copper carbonate is made, as Proust said, in the depths of the world or on its surface by man. So, heating malachite changes it into copper oxide. But of course, copper oxide is not copper. So another change must have taken place in the old furnace. Our ancestors used wood to heat their furnaces. We all know what happens when a wooden match burns. It goes black. This black substance is charcoal and charcoal is carbon. And it is this charcoal that gives us the clue that we need to further investigate what happened in those early days in the blast furnace. Let's cross over to John for some more experimentation. Right, have a look here. I've gouged a hole out of this charcoal block. I'm now going to pack the hole with some black copper oxide. Next, I'm going to use this blowpipe to direct the flame of the Bunsen burner onto the copper oxide. Watch what and see what happens. Do you see the copper oxide keeps glowing even when I stop heating it? This tells us that energy is transferred out of the reactants into the air. The reaction between copper oxide and carbon is an exothermic change. Now we'll let the carbon block cool down and then have a look and see what's happened to the copper oxide. Wow! The black copper oxide seems to have disappeared. A new substance has formed, so we can definitely say that this is a chemical change. All that is in the hollow now is this red-brown pellet. It must be copper. Heating copper oxide with carbon in an open system causes it to change to copper. But what happens to the mass? Do you think it increases, decreases, or stays the same? Isn't that fantastic? Let's look at some data to see if we can answer John's question. Look, 6 grams of copper oxide forms 5 grams of copper. 19 grams of copper oxide forms 15 grams of copper. All the samples of copper oxide lose mass when they react with carbon. The second column in this table shows the mass of four different samples of copper oxide before heating with carbon in a flame. The third column shows the mass of copper obtained from each of these samples after reacting with carbon. 
Did you predict that copper oxide loses mass when it reacts with carbon? Well, if so, you are correct. But not surprisingly, the more copper oxide you react with carbon, the more copper you get. The missing mass must once again be a gas that escapes into the air. Can you guess what the gas is? Look at the word equation again. Copper oxide changes into copper when it reacts with hot carbon. What gas do you think the oxygen and carbon react to form? That's right, carbon dioxide. Now let's look at the proportion of copper in each sample of copper oxide. We work this out by dividing the mass of copper by the mass of copper oxide that it formed from. Why don't you try to calculate the proportion of copper in each sample of copper oxide in our table? Fill in your answers, correct to two decimal places, in the fourth column on the table. Now, compare your values to mine. Once again, we find that the ratio of the mass of copper to the mass of copper oxide is the same for all the samples. This time, 0 0,80. Proust found exactly the same thing for black copper oxide. He did many experiments of the sort between 1797 and 1804. This led him to formulate his law of definite proportions, which states, no matter what size sample of a pure compound is analyzed, it will always contain the same elements in the same proportion by mass. To put this law slightly differently, Proust was saying that a compound is a substance to which nature, not people, assigns fixed atomic ratios. To us, this law may be obvious, but at Proust's time, some chemists did not accept his law of definite proportions. You must remember that chemists in those days had very vague ideas about atoms, and especially about their ability to combine with other atoms. Obviously, people who first extracted copper from malachite had no idea about Proust's law. But they surely knew that the more malachite they combined with charcoal in the furnace, the more copper they got. Today, mining is a very exact science. Mineralogists know exactly how much precious metal a mineral will yield, and this helps people in the mining industry make informed choices about where to open new mines. Now, what happens when we heat copper in the air? The copper is in an open system. Look at the color of the copper foil before I heat it. Do you see its unmistakable red-brown shiny color? Watch how its color changes in the flame. It goes black. This means a new substance has formed. This must be a chemical change. Copper cannot decompose into simpler substances, for it is an element. Rather, heating copper in air makes it combine with the oxygen in the air. The word equation representing this chemical change is copper plus oxygen gives copper oxide. Oxygen, like all matter, has mass, and so combining with oxygen must increase the mass of copper. We call this a synthesis reaction. Now it is time to have a look at your task for today. The table shows the changes in mass when four samples of pure copper are heated in air until all of the copper reacts to form copper oxide. What is the mass of copper oxide divided by the mass of copper for the 80 gram sample? What mass of copper oxide forms for the 80 gram sample? That is all for today's lesson. See you next time.